Welcome to Transmission and Transaxle Components. Uh, this video we're going to be talking about manual transmission and transaxle internal components like the gears, the shafts, the bearings, the synchronizers, and the clutch forks. Um, and uh, this will be part one and part two, the second part, then we're going to get into the power flow. So through this uh, presentation, uh, we'll be discussing all those pieces, but I also have some parts here on the table, and uh, we'll go through and look at those and talk about some of the specifics that uh, we should be able to identify for inspection or for replacement, and uh, the things that you definitely want to look at on the transmissions that you actually have in the lab. If you have any questions, whenever we're in class, just don't hesitate to refer to the video. Um, about something you didn't understand and then we can definitely you know focus on it in in the lab all right so starting off this is a pretty quick uh, or I wouldn't say pretty quick this is a, a pretty in-depth image here now it isn't an exploded view per se but it is uh, a pretty well labeled um, display so let me bring up a, a pin here and we can see all the various pieces on this thing now this end right here because it's got the input shaft uh, obviously this end is going to be mounted up to where the engine is at so we're going to have E for engine and this is a rear wheel drive transmission so this would be going off to the rear axle so we have E for engine and R for rear axle and this is how it's going to be uh, oriented in the images. So the input shaft is the front piece up here. Remember the input shaft only extends to about this far and uh, it doesn't go any farther than that. The output shaft will actually extend into uh, the, uh, the input shaft. So we have all the various gears here. Now this is a five-speed transmission with reverse. So it's, you know, it's a six-speed transmission, uh, but we only consider the forward gears when we you know, talk about a specific model. Like if it was a six-speed transmission, uh, say a, a Camaro, then that would actually be seven gears total because it would have six forward and one reverse. So in this one here, we've got, uh, we have five forward ratios and one reverse. And it's gonna start off um, right in this area where we see we have our first gear. So this is our first gear set where we have our, our counter shaft gear here and then our speed gear here for first. And then we have second, here's our second gear set third and as some of you may know the fourth gear in this in a five-speed transmission doesn't technically exist it's actually just a coupling of the input and the output shaft and then back here in the back we have uh, fifth gear now this transmission compared to the ones in the shop that we're working on this one is different because two things uh, the location of reverse and the other fact is that this isn't a full mesh reverse so the reverse on this one utilizes a synchronizer sleeve which has gears on or teeth on it and it's going to interact with a sliding contact idler which is hey, holding out here over here on the left now this picture you know, it may or may not be very clear to you, and that's fine, but it is just kind of a, an overall layout of, of, a, of a gear set, okay? So, different types of gears that are, that are used in transmissions and transaxles. Uh, we have spur cut, straight cut gears, helical gears, bevel gears, and spiral bevel. So we have the first one, which is our spur cut gears. Uh, this one here, isn't used as much anymore. It may be used for reverse, uh, but that's only going to be for reverse on a transmission that doesn't have full mesh. It's going to be a sliding contact reverse. So when reverse isn't engaged, uh, there's the idler will actually slide out of the way so it doesn't actually drive anything. Uh, the downside to the spur cut gears is that they're very noisy. Uh, if you've ever heard uh, or seen video where they have um, where they have video inside the the the, the cab of a uh, of a race car, and you can hear that gear whine every time the transmission shifts and it's going accelerating. You hear just that's more than likely going to be straight cut gears. They can be very made very strong, but they're just noisy, and that's not something that people want in their passenger cars and light trucks. All right, so the next one is a helical gear, which is this one over here. Uh, this is most common, and it's going to be used in all four gears for modern transmissions ever since you know the 60s. They've been using it. 
Um, and you can see that over here we've got a gear that's, that's going straight across the length or the width of that gear. And this one, the teeth are actually cut in a helix pattern to where if we were to say, let's say that this gear, um, this gear over here and this one were the same thickness, uh, the one with the larger tooth would actually be the helical gear because, it, because it's slanted at an angle, it's able to be a longer tooth. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be stronger. That comes down to other things. But it's definitely going to be a longer tooth. But helical uh, cut gears are very quiet compared to, um, let me see if I can write Q-U-I and then E and T, yeah, that's good enough. They're very quiet, so they're not very noisy. They really should produce uh, little to no noise at all. The downside to them is that you can see that there's this thing called thrust. So as, let's say, this drive gear down here drives the larger driven gear, what's gonna happen is those two gears wanna slide away from each other, and that's just gonna create side thrust. And that's something that engineering has to take into account, not so much us unless we have an application where maybe the slide, uh, the thrust movement of the gear is excessive and that's something that could cause a symptom that only happens on acceleration and not deceleration or something that happens during engine braking but not acceleration because the gear could be shifting back and forth. Then we come down to bevel gears. Uh, bevel gears and we'll go into spiral bevel. Now spiral bevel isn't exactly what we use anymore, uh, but spiral bevel is similar to what's called a hypoid gear and we'll talk about that later. But what these two allow uh, is, is a direction change. So let's say we're looking at the top of the vehicle and we've got a transmission, here's the drive shaft and it needs to get out to the wheels over here. There's one wheel there and then there's a wheel over here. Well, this power that's being transmitted down a shaft here will need to you know, make a right turn this direction and then make a right turn this direction. And that's what uh, bevel gears and spiral bevel and hypoid gears will allow. The other thing is that uh, the, the bevel gears are used within the differential inside a transaxle and in the differential of a rear or front axle. Uh, so these allow for a direction change. So the power can go down a drive shaft and to the driver's side tire or the passenger side tire. The, uh, the spiral bevel is just a little bit more efficient design where the bevel gear can be noisy and have a lot of lash built into it, meaning there's a lot of space in between the gears. Uh, the spiral bevel gear is norm normally quieter. Uh, and, uh, and, and can produce or transmit more torque because again, just like it is over here with the helical gear, you can actually run a longer gear tooth. All right, so gear rotation. Uh, the first thing we're gonna identify are some of the terms for the gears that power goes into and some of the power gears where the power goes out. So sometimes you'll hear me call it the input and the output gear. Well, in that case, uh, this gear here is the input gear, okay? I'll just put I for input, and this is the output gear. So power goes into this one. Let's say a shaft is driving this one, and it's driving it counterclockwise, and then the power is going and being transmitted to the other gear, which is then going clockwise. So if we have an even number of gears in the system, we're going to have a reverse of direction. Like I said, this one is going counterclockwise. So C, C, W, there we go. And this one is going clockwise. So what's happening is that there's just a, a, a reverse of direction. Uh, then we come over here. So if we take these two gears and we just place them apart and we put one in between, you know, we get something called an idler gear. Okay, so our power goes in through this drive gear and you see it's going counterclockwise also, so C, C, W, okay. This one is then going clockwise, but because it's just there as an idler, it's not being used to transmit any power other than from one gear to the next gear, what it's allowing the system to do is then result in a counterclockwise output gear, so C, C, W again. So this one over here, it went counterclockwise to clockwise. We had reverse in the, in the direction. And then in the one on the right, we had counterclockwise. The idler went clockwise, but then the output went counterclockwise again. And that's just what they're talking about here.
All right, so the various gear ratios. Uh, what we have, and I haven't displayed, well, let me go back to one, this here. So if we measure these two uh, gears here, they would have the same number of teeth on them from the input gear to the output gear. Because there's no change in diameter, that means however much speed and torque are input into the first one is what's gonna come out of the second one. And this is what's gonna result into one, uh, one to one, a drive or you might say it's also direct drive so d i r e c t yeah it's close enough there we fix my c so there's direct drive uh, and that's one to one the other ratios that are available are reduction and overdrive when you're taking off from a stop in your car, and I don't care if it's an automatic or a manual, but in the manual you're going to have it in first, maybe second gear, and what's going to happen is the engine is going to rev up to a higher RPM than the output shaft of the transmission. That means the input is going to go faster than the output, or the input will have to make more than one revolution to get the output to make one revolution. So this bottom section right here is a reduction. And you see this gear right here, we have eight teeth as a drive or an input gear, and then 24 the output gear. So that means that, the, that this one here is a three to one ratio. And this is input and this is to output. So while the image kind of has them backwards uh, visually, the ratio is input to output, so that means the input has to make a revol three revolutions for the output to make one. That could be, in a sense, you'll call it first gear. Then we come up to overdrive. Overdrive is something that you want when you're going down uh, the freeway. You want, you, want, you want high speed, low engine RPM for efficiency. And in this one here, we see we have our drive gear on the right again, and this is our input to the system, okay? And then this is the output to the system. So what this one has is 24 teeth to eight teeth. So that means for a third of a revolution of this gear here, we got about a third there, this guy is gonna make one. So that means that this one doesn't even need to make one full revolution to get the output to make one. So the ratio for this one would actually be 0.3 to one. So while this one is a third to one, this one is three to one. And that's the two ends of, 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 of overdrive and, and reduction. Every transmission is gonna have reduction and then one to one and could have overdrive built into it and it just depends on the era where the in, where the transmission comes from all right so on to the different shafts that are available uh, so we have our input shaft and remember the input shaft ends right about here uh, the input shaft is going to be splined to the clutch disc, so on the front of the input shaft, so right about here, there's a series of splines, and those will be splined into the clutch disc. So whenever you let up on the clutch pedal, the clutch disc starts to turn, which then starts to turn the input shaft. Okay, it's also going to drive uh, the counter shaft. So whenever the clutch is engaged, this gear right here is always in mesh with this gear right here. So we have our input gear for the input shaft and then our counter shaft input gear or they call the input gear driven uh, because it's driven by the input gear. These two are always going to spin, spin with each other, okay? So we go to the input shaft and let's step down to this one which is our counter shaft. So our counter shaft goes from here all the way to back here. And the counter shaft, as it says right here, it rotates opposite the input shaft. So you kind of think, well, counter shaft, so counter to rotation, and that's what that stands for. And then our main shaft. So our main shaft, uh, while the input shaft ends here, the main shaft actually extends a little bit into the input shaft and it goes all the way out to where the drive shaft, the transfer case then meets up to it, either through a splined or through a, uh, a flange that's bolted on, okay? So let's go ahead and flip over to the table and I'm gonna show you some of these parts, uh, some of these parts on the table. So let's move these out of the way, and we're going to show you the input shaft here. Uh, 
and let's go ahead and keep this bearing there. We have our counter shaft and then our input shaft for this particular transmission model. So you notice how long the input shaft, or the, sorry, the output shaft is. The output shaft is also called uh, the main shaft. Uh, and, and they go by both names. So output shaft or main shaft is what this one is. And then we have our input shaft. Now notice the input shaft, we have this blind section here on the front. We also have this, uh, this polished end out here. And this is really for the support of the main, or the input shaft because it's being supported right here. Uh, there's a bearing inside here on the end of the main shaft. And then there's a conical bearing or it could have a roller or a ball bearing. But with these things here, this guy could still wiggle and wobble some. So this bearing, which is located inside the crankshaft or the flywheel, is going to support the end of it. And that's called the pilot bearing. <clears throat> so we see the back end of the input shaft where we have uh, what looks like some teeth on it. Okay, we have these teeth. These are called the clutching teeth, and we'll get to more of that later. And we also have, uh, this is our input gear. Now notice this one has got some damage to it. Um, something happened to this transmission. So it now is a demonstration model. Uh, our counter shaft, so here we have our counter shaft. This is the input gear for the counter shaft and this is where the input shaft will run against it. And these two are always gonna be meshed. So that means if this one's spinning, this one's spinning down there. Across the length of this counter shaft, we have some other gears. Now these gears are actually made onto this. They're part of this shaft. So if we have a situation like this to where these gears are damaged for our input gear to the counter shaft, you have to replace the whole thing. It's not like we can pop it off and pop it back, pop on a new one. So we have our, our third, our second, and our first counter gears, and then our counter input gear. On the back of this, we do have uh, some polished surfaces, a spline surface for a synchronizer. Uh, so there's gonna be some components that are slid on the back here or they're pressed on in the back of this counter shaft. So more about the output shaft. On the back end of this output shaft, this is what sticks out of the back of the transmission. This is splined so that on this model, a, a drive shaft slip yoke will actually slide up onto this and allow for length changes as the suspension articulates. On the other end of this main shaft, we have a couple sections. This is where our second speed gear is going to sit, and this is where our third speed gear is going to sit. And we have. Let me make sure I'm over here. Okay, and then we have this blind section where our three, four synchronizer is going to sit. Um, and in this case here, this is where the input shaft sits. Now inside the input shaft, inside this pocket here, the end of this is going to be riding. So the input shaft is not only supported by a bearing about here and then possibly the slip yoke in the back, but it's also going to be supported by a, uh, by a bearing that goes on the end of the input shaft, and this bearing is called the pocket bearing, okay? It's called the pocket bearing. So I think that's everything with shafts, so let's move back over to the table, or back over to the, the presentation. Okay, we're back. Now we're getting into the synchronizer assembly. So our synchronizer assembly is a, a series of components that a lot of people just equate them into one thing. Um, and they're really not one thing. They're actually a collection of, of uh, they're an assembly of components. And there's different types, but we need to identify the components. Now, what a synchronizer is, is the component or the assembly that allows you to shift from first to second or second to third or fifth down to fourth without grinding the gears in the transmission. If you've ever, ever ground a manual transmission gears, you know it's a very coarse sounding, it sounds, it's very damaging in some cases, uh, but you don't have to match the speeds inside the transmission. So if you go back to many years past, uh, there were transmissions where you had to match the speeds of the input and the output shaft before you completed a shift. So imagine you were driving this, say it's a Willis Jeep, and you, you take off in first gear and you pull it back to second. If you were just to pull it back immediately to second gear, 
uh, the, the, the speeds of everything would be going at the wrong, they'd be going at different speeds. So what, what's trying to happen is this synchronizer sleeve, it actually moves back and forth, it's trying to grab onto these little teeth right here. And in that case, this speed gear would be going relative to, uh, relative to the input shaft and the synchronizer would be going relative to the vehicle speed. So if the engine RPM was up too high and the vehicle was going uh, too slow, then those two speeds wouldn't match and you'd actually get a grinding sound between them. So what a synchronizer does is it actually acts as a clutch mechanism to speed up or slow down depending on what type of application, what type of shift it is, is it an upshift or downshift, tries to speed up or slow down uh, the, the, the speed gear, the, the counter shaft, the input shaft, and the clutch disc. Whenever you push in the clutch pedal, those things are allowed to slow down or speed up based on whether the engine is idling down or whether you're holding the RPM up with the gas pedal. Or if this little guy right here, the blocker ring, is forcing the, uh, the, the components to match their speeds. So whenever a transmission starts to grind, and that's, that's possibly in most cases because of a damaged synchronizer assembly or a component within the synchronizer assembly. All right, so uh, the various components that we have going on in here, uh, from left to right, we have our synchronizer ring. It's got different names. It could be called a blocker ring or a synchronizer ring. The next thing is a sleeve, and then we have our clutch hub. So we have the synchronizer sleeve, or sorry, the synchronizer ring or blocker ring, the sleeve here. We have the synchronizer hub, they call it a clutch hub, we'll call it a synchronizer hub. And then we have our inserts, or they call them key springs. I call them inserts. Uh, sorry, they're called inserts or keys. And then the spring, which is actually a separate component, actually pushes tension out against those. Another synchronizer ring, and then our speed gear. Now the speed gear as a whole is not necessarily part of the synchronizer components, but there's a section right here, which is those second small set of teeth, and then this component right here, which is a, a shiny section of the speed gear, which acts as a, a braking cone. All right, so our first part is the, uh, the blocker ring that we're gonna talk about. Now a blocker ring is also referred to as a synchro ring, I don't know why that one rubs me wrong, but I don't like the term synchro ring. It's also called a bulk ring, B-A-U-L-K ring. Nissan uses that term. Uh, I've heard synchronizer ring. I call them blocker rings. So maybe blocker ring was just somebody uh, mispronouncing bulk ring. I, I don't know, but it is a term that I've seen used in the industry. So these are the clutching components that are gonna be really tasked with changing the speed of the synchronizer, uh, of, the, of the speed gear, the counter shaft, the input shaft, and the clutch disc, okay? And these things are only operated against, or operated, or forced to work during a shift. Once the shift is over, they go back to just kind of floating in a little bit of space that they have available. Uh, so if failed, so if they're worn out or say they're damaged, they could cause a transmission to be hard to shift, meaning it's hard to go in a gear, or it could cause grinding in a gear. And that's really if it's worn out. Now there are different types of friction surfaces on these things. Um, I have two right here. The first one is siped, or they call them oil grooves. It's called, it, it, another term for it is siping. Um, and then we have another one here, which is a uh, friction material is applied to the inside of the clutch, uh, uh, sorry, of the, of the blocker ring. There are some other ones where uh, the ring will actually be made out of cast iron or steel. And on the inside of it, they'll spray on either molybdenum, which is uh, a metal that they can melt. And it will spray it on uh, as if it was kind of like uh, welding it on there. And they can do the same thing with brass or bronze. So there's different types of blocker rings out there. There's another type which actually has more than one blocker ring in a sense, but we'll get to that one in a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here to the table so that we can look at the blocker ring assemblies and try and get a good close up view of these things so we can see, uh, see what they look like, okay?
Here we are at the table where we've got a couple different types of blocker rings. So, um, and actually we have two types of blocker rings initially. Uh, the first type here is probably the most common and this one is just a, a brass blocker ring. And it's the one that has the siping, which is um, kind of a, a sawtooth or an oil groove pattern inside here. So let's see if I can get this to zoom in to focus in. There we go, we should be able to get that in there. So inside this, on the ID of this thing, that there's actually a, a series of grooves that are machined into it and on the circumference on the inside of it. And the way you can check these is just by taking your finger and rubbing it in one direction and in the other. And in one direction, it should slip. In the other direction, you actually should feel it catch because this kind of is a, a sawtooth pattern. And it's used to cut through the oil during a shift so that uh, the, uh, the, the speeds are matched. Now the next style is, you know, it's a very similar format as far as the, uh, the, the brass blocker ring here. So it's a real, real similar format. Uh, but instead of having the grooves machined on the inside of it, we have a, a paper that's applied or a friction material that's applied. It may or may not be paper. It could be a carbon fiber based material or Kevlar. And, uh, and, and actually on this one here, something happened during cleaning where the paper actually came out of it. So you can kind of see what this looks like when it's out, but it's just a, just a people, piece of uh, a friction material that's just, it's inside there. All right, so now we've backed up some. Uh, we can see what this thing goes with. So we have a speed gear here, and on the front of this speed gear, we've got this, this machined cone section called a speed gear cone. And it's, uh, it's cut at the same angle as the blocker ring is gonna be cut, so that when this guy gets put down on there, if I put any force to push it on, it actually locks it in place pretty tightly. So you can imagine during a shift, this guy is gonna get pressed down onto that cone, which is gonna cause either this to slow down or speed up, or the, 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 the synchronizer assembly to slow, slow down or speed up. So this is the brake cone for it. Now, if we were to look at one for um, a different application, like one for a, uh, a regular brass blocker ring, it's gonna be machined in just the same fashion. <clears throat> so, all right, so back over here. All right, so we're back over at the, the presentation here and we've got our next type of blocker ring assemblies which is called the triple cone or it's also called the micro synchronizer just, just depends on what manufacturer thought they came up with it and they're going to have their own name now this one here is used to uh, used to really make the, the shift more guaranteed and more precise so there's less chance of the transmission grinding when going into gear uh, my thing about these is that should, they should never grind, never, no matter how quickly you shift or how hard you shift, it really should never grind because that's how good they are at synchronizing. So the components on this one, we have our outer ring, which looks like a blocker ring, but in this case here, it may or may not have friction material applied at the inside. Then we have the middle ring, or what's sometimes called the floating cone, and you can see it has these four tabs. There's a tab there a tab there, a tab here, and a tab there. And those, that floating cone or the middle ring is actually gonna lock into these holes on the face of the speed gear. So instead of having a cone part of the speed gear, this one is gonna have a cone that's gonna engage into it and it's gonna be able to float. Then we have our inner ring, and this inner ring may or may not have friction material applied to its outside diameter. So what's gonna happen is we have our inner ring, which is gonna stack inside the floating cone, and our floating cone is then gonna stack inside the outer ring. So it essentially doubles the surface area for synchronizing. So I've got one of those over here on the table, and we can see, make sure it's in focus here, Okay, so we can see the different components. So we have our inner ring here. We've got our, our cone, or they call it the middle ring. And then we have our outer ring. So we have our three pieces. And you can see on this one, the floating cone actually has the friction material applied to the inside of it and the outside of it. 
and uh, you know that that's essentially doubling the surface area for synchronizing. Now, if I get the speed gear for this application, and I compare it to a, a regular uh, synchronizer blocker ring ski, speed gear, this one here on the left, notice it doesn't have a cone on it, and the one on the right, it does. That's because the floating cone, or the middle ring, actually sits down inside those notches, and it will then drive or be driven by the speed gear. So that's how this one operates. Uh, and these tend to be very good at synchronizing the transmission whenever you go in to shift into that gear. In this transmission that I have on the table, uh, I believe, yeah, first and second both use the triple cone, uh, and then the remaining gears uh, just use a single synchronizer block or ring to synchronize it. Okay? All right, so the synchronizer sleeve, uh, we have the sleeve, the inserts, and the springs because they all work together. Uh, the sleeve, inserts, and springs are there for a couple of reasons. The sleeve on the synchronizer hub um, it, well, it slides back and forth on the synchronizer hub and can engage onto the speed gear whenever that gear needs to be engaged. So we see that this has a set of splines. Now these are raised sections, okay, and they extend across the, the width of this sleeve. And I have an, uh, an example sleeve on the table here. Um, and what it'll do is this sleeve actually moves back and forth and it will grab onto the clutching teeth on the speed gear. The other thing about the sleeve is that it needs to be held in the centered position or neutral position whenever that synchronizer is not being needed. Because if you're in first gear, do you need fourth and fifth to do anything? Or do you need, uh, sorry, third and fourth? Or do you need fifth and reverse to do anything? Well, no, they need to stay in their centered position. So what they've done is they've machined a, a groove that goes around the circumference on the inside of this sleeve and that then uh, corresponds with some uh, uh, bosses or bumps made onto the back of the inserts. Now the inserts uh, are there to hold uh, the sleeve in, in center position and they also are there to drive the blocker rings. All right, so back to the table. I've got a whole synchronizer assembly here and with its complementing blocker ring. So notice when I put this thing down in there, it locks in. And the reason it's locking in is because of the insert. So these inserts are protruding through into this inner groove or the space groove and it won't go in unless they're lined up. So if I try to put this thing in where they're not lined up, see how it's sitting proud of the surface? But as I rotate it around, it snaps into place right about there and then it's being driven uh, the blocker ring is then being driven by the synchronizer assembly so I'm going to pop this thing apart so we're going to pop it apart like this and we can see uh, we have our springs so we have an insert spring here now these inserts are also called uh, keys or um, what's the other term for them There you go, uh, enter keys or struts, okay? Called inserts, keys, or struts. And then the springs are springs. So we look on the, on, the, uh, on the back of this insert, and we can see it's got a bump on the back of that insert, okay? There's a bump right there, let's see, see it there. And then on the inside of the sleeve, it's got a corresponding notch machined into it. So when the sleeve gets into that position, that centered position, the insert snaps into it and holds it in its detented neutral position. Now that's important because we don't want this sleeve bouncing back and forth because the first thing it hits when it bounces back and forth are gonna be the blocker rings. And if this is the first and second synchronizer, and it's bouncing back and forth, hitting the first and the second blocker rings against the speed gears, and you're going down the highway, that will accelerate the wear on those blocker rings and cones. And it could cause a transmission to grind very prematurely. So we want to make sure that the uh, make sure that the inserts and everything are assembled properly. Now, how do we assemble it? It's a pretty simple procedure. You'll get to do this too. 
All right, so this is the way that I do it. You need to make sure you line up one of these three notches with the, the machine notch on the inside of the sleeve. So I just make sure I line it up with the center one and I just push it together. Notice it just wants to fall out right now. I'm gonna take one of the blocker rings that belongs and I'm gonna line up the notches for the insert along with the notch on the, on the hub and I'm gonna drop in my inserts. So I'm gonna drop in the first, second, and drop in I get that guy to go in right there we go and we got the third going in right here okay and I'm going to take one of my insert springs now sometimes these are directional but for now I'm just going to stick it in there in the counterclockwise direction so that one's in now I'm going to take my whole deal and turn it over and then put in the other side making sure that this spring engages all of the inserts because you don't want to have one insert that's loose because I don't know how it could fall out, but you know, anything could happen, right? So we just make sure that that insert then goes into, or the insert spring goes in and it grabs onto that insert. There we go. Now they're all being pressed. I can take the, uh, the blocker ring and this is gonna help me to locate the spring all the way down. So I push that in. Okay, good. And I go to the other side and I'm gonna push it down. As I line it up here, I line it up and I push it down. So the way that this is assembled, I should be able to grab it by the sleeve and the hub not fall out. If you don't line up the notches for the inserts on the groove for the inside of the sleeve, then it's just going to slip and fall out. It needs to stay together just like this. Okay. All right, now on the inside of the sleeve, uh, we have a geometry that's built into it. So, so what they've done right here is um, kind of exploded the view and even more so. This is the spline on the inside of the sleeve. This is the raised section on the inside. And you can see it has this shape to it, okay? And that's called torque lock. So what torque lock does is keeps that transmission in gear during acceleration and deceleration. And some people have tried this, but have you ever tried to pull the transmission shifter out of gear while you're accelerating? It shouldn't be able to pop out very easily. It actually should take quite a bit of force. And what's happening is the clutching teeth that are on the speed gear are a complementary shape to where we have, pardon my drawing here, there we go, there we go. Okay, so let's just say this was a perfect drawing. There we go. And you can see that this angle and, and the angle here, they complement each other and they kind of grasp onto each other. And if that happens all the way around the circle, then torque lock is engaged and you'll be able to um, accelerate without having to hold the shifter in that gear. Now, as a synchronizer starts to wear, especially if it's accelerated wear and the transmission starts to grind, well, that torque lock is actually gonna start to wear away. All right, now onto the synchronizer hub. So the synchronizer hub is almost always gonna be splined in the center and it's gonna be splined onto the shaft that it's located on. So synchronizers can be on the main shaft and they can be on the counter shaft. Um, they can all be on the main shaft or some can be on the main shaft and some can be on the counter shaft for a manual rear wheel drive transmission. Uh, but the synchronizer hubs, um, you know, they're, they are directional just like the sleeves. The sleeves can be directionals. Uh, the, the, the synchronizer blocker rings can be required to go on one side and the other. So these are going to house the inserts. Um, they could also house springs. And they could also be what drives the blocker ring. Earlier we said the inserts drive the blocker ring. Well, some blocker rings have bosses built onto them that will actually notch into this section right here. And then the insert will be there just to hold the sleeve in its neutral position. So that's synchronizer hubs. Now during the shift, what's happening uh, is that you're taking a shift fork or your shifter, which is eventually connected to a shift fork. And that shift fork is mounted inside here and it goes sometimes around about half of it, um, so it could be less, and it's gonna force this synchronizer sleeve, this thing right here, either this way, okay, or this way, depending on if it's a first gear to second gear shift or 
and you're putting it in gear, you're going to be moving the, the, the synchronizer sleeve. Now in this situation here, we're actually in neutral. And notice that there's actually an air gap in between the blocker ring and the cone on the, on the speed gear on that side and an air gap between the blocker ring and the cone on this side. And remember we talked about the sleeve needs to be held in center with the detents from the inserts because if this thing is allowed to move back and forth, even just incidental contact between this blocker ring and the sleeve and up against this cone is going to cause that cone and blocker ring to wear an accelerated rate. If you think about it this way, the only time this thing gets used is during a shift. Well, you know, whenever you get on the highway, you're going to shift four times. You know, you start in first, you go second, third, fourth, and fifth, and you're done. But if something in the system is allowing that sleeve to bounce back and forth, that's essentially over 100 miles, or say a mile, it could be 10 or 20 or even hundreds of shifts because of the bouncing back and forth, forcing that blocker ring onto the comb, accelerating the wear. All right, now we're starting a shift. So in this case here, we have our same components and the fork is sitting inside here. The fork on this one is forcing the sleeve over here to the right. And the first thing that it's gonna hit, and now this is actually the synchronization that's happening. The first thing it hits are the splines on the inside of this blocker ring are gonna try and slide over the blocker ring splines. They're not gonna match up. There's some slop in between the two. And because of that slop or that slack, the sleeve is actually gonna contact the teeth on the blocker ring. And when it does that, it pushes the blocker ring. So in addition to the sleeve moving over, the blocker ring is gonna to start to move over, okay? When it gets moved over, it actually gets forced onto the cone. And when it gets forced onto the cone, in this case, let's say this is first, second, third um, gear for a real drive transmission, the output shaft is tied to the hub. So our output shaft is gonna be splined to the hub. So we can't speed up or slow down the output shaft because it's tied to the vehicle. What's gonna happen is when you push in the clutch pedal that releases torque from the input shaft, which then allows the input shaft, the counter shaft, and the speed gears here, okay, and over here to spin at whatever necessary speed they find. So whenever this guy is being forced up against it, what's happening is it's forcing this speed gear, if we're doing an upshift, to slow down <coughs> the speed gear and slow down the counter shaft and slow down the input shaft. So we come to the next section where we're fully engaged. Now, once those speeds all match up, then the blocker ring will actually slip into the splines inside the sleeve and then the sleeve will continue on over the blocker ring and because the speeds are matched between the hub and the speed gear the blocker or sorry the, 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 the synchronizer sleeve will then slip over the end and then grab onto the clutching teeth engaging torque lock that's a shift Okay. If something fails in that system, in a lot of cases it's going to be the, the actual blocker ring is worn, or it could be a shift fork is damaged, or even the sleeve is damaged. Uh, you're going to have an app, or you have a situation where the, the splines on the sleeve will try to grab onto the clutching teeth on the speed gear. Because they're going at different speeds, they're going to grind against each other. So that's what happens when you're grinding a transmission is that the sleeve splines are trying to grab onto the clutching teeth on the speed gear. And because they're going at two different speeds, they're grinding. So whenever you're grinding gears inside transmissions, you're not actually grinding gears, you're grinding splines. All right, so here's that question we just answered. So when the transmission grinds during a shift, what components are making the noise? Well, in this case here, we have a speed gear over here on the right, and we have this row of teeth, okay? Not the main teeth, but these row of teeth here, which is called the clutching teeth, are grinding against the face of the splines on the sleeve because they're going at two different speeds. They can't, they're not meshing and the sleeve is trying to grab onto them, but they're still moving at the wrong speed. All right, now we're down to a shift fork. So shift forks are pretty simple devices. You can see this one here has kind of a U shape to it. 
uh, and this shift fork is what's going to slide into the slot on a um, on a what's it called a synchronizer sleeve. Now shift forks can be made out of brass, like pure brass. They can be made out of aluminum, and they can be made out of steel. Now, depending on the application, they're going to have wear surfaces. So this one here would normally have a plastic or a nylon bushing that actually snaps onto that and snaps on over here. And that provides a wear surface for the, uh, for the, for the shift fork during operation. All right, so here in the picture, you can see I've actually got that exact same fork, and it has these plastic pads or bushings that are snapped into place, and these are actually what contact the sleeve. And you might think, well, plastic or nylon, that's not very strong. Remember, this only gets pressure applied to it during a shift. So let's say this is for reverse. Whenever this goes into reverse in this direction, that's the only time this pad really should contact anything with very much force at all. Another type of fork that I have here is out of an old uh, German transmission. Uh, this one's entirely made out of brass. So if you disassemble these transmissions and this thing's damaged, it's going to be expensive. Now, why they use brass, there's probably multiple reasons. One is the weight of this, so it tends to uh, help transmission shift. Uh, the other thing is that brass can actually, could be a bronze material, but it could be self-lubricating or a very good wear surface. And we see that there's a step in this, and this is not um, a wear step. This is actually manufactured that way because we can see the same step is on the other side. And this engages onto the sleeve and it provides a really good wear surface uh, to push that sleeve back and forth. Okay. All right, so now we're down to the speed gear. So the speed gear in this trans, or any transmissions, like I said earlier, it's gonna have uh, either the helical, it could be straight cut. It's gonna have, the they call it beveled dog teeth or clutching teeth is another name, okay? But the biggest thing about a speed gear is the fact that it's not attached to the shaft that it's on. A speed gear is going to be on a bearing. It's going to have a bearing support underneath it. Now that bearing could be a ball bearing, it could be a roller bearing, it could be a needle bearing, but it's going to have a bearing underneath it. Now we've already talked about the integral and non-integral cone. Um, and then of course the, the, the clutching teeth or dog teeth that they talk about. Now remember, this, uh, this has a special shape to it, and that is torque lock, okay? Now, speed gears can be a drive or a driven component, meaning they could be located on the output shaft and be driven, or they can be located on the counter shaft and be a drive component. So they can be one way or the other. Now, they're not interchangeable. You can't take one and put it up on the top and then the other one down the bottom because of the ratios involved. Now for some transmissions, we have reverse, which is a sliding contact. That means uh, a gear actually moves back and forth. For that to happen, you can't really do that easily with helical gears, so you have a straight cut gear. Notice the teeth on this gear are straight. So you could imagine when this transmission's in reverse, it's gonna be a little bit noisy. Another thing about it, because this gear is actually sliding in and out of contact with the, its two mating gears, because it's reverse and it's an idler, just like in that image from earlier, that you may not be able to put this thing in a gear every single time. Sometimes you're going to have two gear faces hit each other and they're just not going to slip past. So you might have to push the, wiggle the shifter a little bit, let the clutch out, let the car roll, and then try it again and it should go into reverse. So reverse idlers for this case, when it's a sliding contact type gear, uh, you're gonna have two characteristics that they may not be used to. One, it may not go into reverse perfectly the first time every time. And two, when you're in reverse, it could be noisier than normal and if that could be normal. All right, so we're down to bearings. Um, inside this transmission, we have different bearing locations and different bearing types. So our first bearing is going to be located up here on, and this is internal to the transmission, is, is our input bearing. And remember, we have our input, or our main shaft. Our input shaft ends here. Our main shaft actually goes inside 
the input shaft and that gets us to our next bearing which is our pocket bearing okay our pocket bearing goes inside a pocket inside the input shaft and that's important to remember because of diagnosis uh, the next bearings might be located on the out or will be located on the output shaft and we could have a bearing back here or there could be a bearing located in here. It just depends on the design. And then of course counter shaft bearings where we're going to have a bearing here on the front and we could have one in the middle like this one here it has a bearing that's going to be located right there. Um, and of course there's different types of bearings uh, and that's something we'll see in class. Now a bearing that didn't mention on here is the bearing that goes up front. I did mention it earlier and this is the pilot bearing. The pilot bearing supports the end of the input shaft and it's going to be located in the back of the crankshaft or in the flywheel. All right, so that's the end of part one. Um, the next part is going to be talking about power flow for a transmission. Now it's not going to be our specific transmission because you're going to be doing that one yourself. Now a lot of things are going to be the same steps, but differences are going to really show up when we get into uh, fifth gear and reverse and first. So that's what we've got so far. And uh, until next time, I'll see you later.